The foster care system in this country has always faced massive challenges, underfunded and poorly run agencies, not enough families with the means or courage to take in foster kids. Now, throw in the scourge of the opioid uh, crisis creeping through communities across this nation, and the number of children needing foster homes soars. How do we meet that challenge? This hour on point, the children of the opioid epidemic. You can join us on air or online. Is this a story you know too well? Do you have parents, grandparents overdosing or dying? Is your community swamped with a new generation of kids needing homes? Join us at onpointradio.org or on Twitter and Facebook at On Point Radio. Joining me in the studio this hour is Sherry Lockman, founder and executive director of Foster America. It's a nonprofit that recruits and trains people from the private sector to become the next generation of leaders for the nation's foster care systems. She was formerly a domestic policy advisor to Vice President Joe Biden. She was also a foster child. Sherry, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So children are pouring into state and county foster care systems across this country because of the opioid crisis. Help us understand the extent of this problem. Over the past four years, there's been a spike in the number of kids coming into foster care, and that's after a decade of decline in the number of kids coming in. In Montana, for example, the number of children in foster care has doubled since 2010. In Georgia, it has increased by 80 percent. And in West Virginia, it's increased by 45 percent. Currently, there are about 440,000 kids in foster care on every day, and that's up from about 400,000 in 2011. And while neglect remains the main reason that kids come into foster care, drug abuse according to the data and according to many experts, is largely responsible for the spike in the number of kids coming in over the past four years. So there's been a long-standing crisis, as we know, in America's foster care system, but this opioid epidemic is making the problem exponentially worse. It is making it unbelievably worse. Child welfare systems across the country are struggling to keep up with the number of kids coming into foster care. There aren't enough foster homes uh, because of the increase, and that means many kids end up sleeping in their social workers' offices. It means that too many kids end up being shipped off to prison-like institutions, essentially modern-day orphanages, because there are not enough foster homes. And based on common sense and also based on the research, we know that kids who end up in group homes and institutions end up doing worse than other kids. So the system itself was built for an earlier time, right? I mean, culturally, um, it was built when there were two parent families and one Mm. parent was at home often. I mean, now our capable foster families, they're aging out. Budget cuts on social agencies Mm -hmm. are making it terribly difficult. And then comes the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect storm. You're absolutely correct. So just as the number of kids in foster care is going up, at the same time, we see the number of foster homes available to these kids going down. Based on research done by the Chronicle of Social Change, we see that in at least 50, in at least half of states, the number of foster homes available are mm-hmm. going down. And as you correctly intuited, one of the major reasons for that is that the foster care system was not built for this day and age. So we need to do a lot to reform the system to make it a system that is accessible to the modern family. So meaning, for example, foster parents need more support than they're currently getting in places where they're not getting child care and both parents, both foster parents work. We need states and counties to step up and provide child care and other services to them to make fostering feasible. I'm reading uh, here a lot of social workers with this opioid epidemic talk about seeing younger and younger Mm. children into the system, right? I mean, opioid affected babies coming into the foster care system across this country, right? That's that's absolutely right. And I was talking to Molly McGrath-Tierney, who's the former head of the Baltimore Child Welfare Agency the other day, and she's concerned that because for so long uh, the foster care system was dealing with older kids and not with as many babies, that the child welfare workforce in many places is not prepared to deal with the needs of the babies coming in. Hmm. 
Here's some sound. Uh, Justine Dale uh, from East Falmouth Elementary School on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, her responsibilities as principal there have increased exponentially as more and more parents have become addicts. In the past three years, 12 parents of students at that school have died. Here's Dale on NBC News in October. What were your first clues that, oh my goodness, we've got a, a really bad crisis here? I think when we started having parent deaths and having to enter a first grade classroom and, and tell students you know, that their classmate has lost a parent, and then to have to do that again and to do it again. And then Justine goes on to say how children of addicts bring their trauma to school with them. We are having students come to school, if they come to school, late. They're traumatized by what they've experienced over the weekend or in that evening and lash out at people or uh, withdraw. Or the opposite, get right. quiet. Find a corner anywhere and just get into the fetal position. And when that happens, what do you do? We wrap our arms around them and, and bring them in. Hmm. So what Justine is talking about actually raises a broader and very important point. And that point is that child welfare is not the problem of the child welfare system alone. These kids span across many different systems. And it's, it's terrible that our country has been treating the child welfare crisis as just a problem of the child welfare system. We actually need to address this cross-sector problem with a cross-sector solution. That's actually a premise at the core of an organization that I run called Foster America. So for example, in the context of schooling, we need much more collaboration between child welfare agencies and schools on, first of all, identifying families in crisis earlier to prevent the problems from getting as out of hand as just Dean was just talking about, and we need collaboration between schools and child welfare agencies on treating those problems and help teaching teachers how do you teach in a trauma-informed way? How do you help kids overcome these challenges? So you talk about collaboration, and it's so important. I mean, I think about those people on the front lines, the child welfare agencies that are doing this heroic mm -hmm. uh, work. Talk about the significant strain on resources with the opioid epidemic, with all these kids flooding into the foster care system. It's not just social workers who are overwhelmed. It's case managers, it's public defenders, it's guardian ad litems. I mean, there's a real ripple effect going on here in a very real way. There, there absolutely is. And unfortunately, because the child welfare crisis in our country is a problem hiding in plain sight. The child welfare system is not getting the resources, the attention, or the talent or accountability that it needs to address this influx. So help us understand how the foster care system works sure. in this country. When a child is brought in, mm -hmm. what happens? Yes. So first important point to understand is that the child welfare system impacts many more children in this country than most people think. So based on research, one in eight children in our country, one in eight, mm. are abused or neglected by the time they turn 18. And when abuse or neglect happens or when a kid is orphaned, what happens is our country's child welfare system, which is essentially a network of federal, state, and local government systems, the child welfare system steps in and does one of two things with these uh, kids and their families. It either provides services to them in their homes. So, for example, when the abuse and neglect doesn't rise to a level where the kid needs to be removed, the family will receive services such as counseling. And in the worst cases, it yanks the kids out of their homes and places them in foster care. I would say that foster care is like chemo. It's really important in some circumstances, just as chemo is for cancer patients. But you want to be careful not to use it on kids who don't absolutely need it because it's inherently traumatizing for children to go through foster care. Well, so talk about that trauma because laws in the United States require that child welfare agencies make every, quote, reasonable effort to unify parents with their kids. But I would assume that that parents with an opioid addiction, mm -hmm. you know, those those kids, it can be especially traumatic for them because the recidivism rate for opioid addicts is so high, right? Up to 70 percent, I'm reading in most cases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So parents can't keep sober enough to keep their kids. And then you've got the trauma of kids going back and forth, mm -hmm. being reunited with their parents and then coming back again. I mean, it's, it's, it's very traumatic and scarring for these kids. It's incredibly devastating uh, for these kids and their families. 
we actually have some solutions. We actually know what tends to work better. We're just not investing the resources in scaling those things. So, for example, there are family drug treatment programs that not only treat the drug addiction of the parents, but also treat the trauma of the kids. Unfortunately, those programs are few and far between across our country. Mm -hmm. There's also family treatment drug courts, which unlike regular juvenile justice, uh, sorry, unlike re regular juvenile courts, unlike regular child welfare courts, they are far more focused on helping families with substance abuse issues and helping them heal. And based on research, we see that the types of programs I'm talking about actually do a much better job of safely and in a more healthy way reunifying these families. We just don't do enough of these things. Well, we've all seen the images. Uh, here's some video of one. On New Year's Eve a year ago, police in Florida found Joey, Aiden, and Nicholas Kelsey crying in the back of their family's car on Interstate 4. Here's a report courtesy of Orlando's WKMG News 6. A family's car seen on this police dash cam. Inside the car, three crying children, ages 5, 2, and 1. What's not visible from the camera, their parents lying dead just outside the car. Autopsies would reveal that the couple overdosed on fentanyl. And so typically in most cases, those are the kind of kids that are going to be going into the foster care system. That's absolutely right. Well, we are discussing this hour uh, the foster care crisis in conjunction with the opioid crisis going on in this country. Later in the hour, we'll talk to a young woman in Michigan who was a foster child because of her mother's opioid addiction. We'd love to have you join this conversation. Is your own town grappling with this twin crisis? Are you a foster parent? Did you lose your parents to opioids? I'm Jane Clayson. There's much more after this break. We'll be right back. This is On Point. Support for On Point and the following message come from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, and your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash on point. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. I'm Scott Detrow. There is so much political news to follow these days, but you don't have to keep up with all of it. You just have to keep up with us on the NPR Politics Podcast. You can find us on the NPR One app or wherever you get your podcasts. This is On Point. I'm Jane Clayson. We're looking at how the nation's foster care system, government agencies and foster families are seeing the impact of the opioid epidemic on children. And you can join the conversation. Are you living this nightmare? Is this your family's story? Follow us on Twitter and find us on Facebook at On Point Radio. My guest this hour is Sherry Lockman, founder and executive director of Foster America. She's been giving us the bird's eye view of this challenge. Let me bring a caller from Spartanburg, South Carolina in here. Bill is on the line. Hi, Bill. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, um, I was dating someone. They had four children that they had received from two different sets of their children. Well, she was the grandmother, and uh, the parents would come in and out of their lives. Just it was always some kind of recklessness, some kind of madness, and and uh, one of them had went to another state to have another child because they thought for some reason that they would be um, immune from uh, prosecution, which they were immune from prosecution. But they didn't. They took the baby about a week after the child was born, and all this is just you don't feel sorry for the parents anymore. It comes a point where you just feel sorry for the children. And you don't know what to do except for you, the parents just seem to be the, get the state doesn't do anything to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't understand how you can have mm -hmm. children and, and, and to be addicted to drugs with a strike against them mm -hmm. and nobody care about it. Mm -hmm. And each of the parents in this case uh, had an opioid addiction bill. Is that right? Oh, yes. Every one of them. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, meth 
and um, anything that just about anything they could do. Bill, thank you very much for the call there in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Let me bring in another voice from Toledo, Ohio, Helen Jones Kelly. She's executive director of alcohol, drug addiction, and mental health services for Montgomery County, Ohio. Before that, she was director of children's services for the county. Helen, thank you for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So are you seeing a spike in foster care in your county because of the opioid epidemic? Certainly the epidemic has had quite an impact um, on the number of children who've come into care. Uh, But we have to think back to the fact that we've always had an issue with substance abuse as part of the reasoning for young people coming into foster care, Um, whether it was alcohol, um, cocaine, Marijuana, there have always been a significant number of youth, even across the country, who've come into care because of parental misuse. Mm -hmm. But is it getting worse with the opioid crisis? It's getting worse. I think it's because we are so laser-focused on this crisis because our reality is that alcohol is still the biggest drug Mm -hmm. issue that we have. Mm -hmm. But because of the level of focus on the opioid crisis, we're seeing more and more young people are bringing more and more young people into care because of opioids or the prescription drug misuse in their household. So homes. traditionally other caregivers in the family are the first to jump in and care for these kids, but what we're hearing is that the opioid epidemic is taking a toll on whole family systems, on the whole structure of the family. Tell us about that, would you? That's absolutely correct. Um, The first option is always looking at other familial relatives who are able to provide a level of care for children whose parents are not available to them because we want to keep families as intact as possible because the one thing we know is that young people tend to go back to their family of origin when they leave foster care. But because of the uh, depth and breadth of this epidemic, family members simply are not available in the way that they used to be. So even Grandma and Aunt Mary uh, are grappling with the addiction, too. Absolutely, yes. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Earlier, Sherry Lockman talked about kids, foster kids, sleeping in the offices of social workers, kids being shipped off to prison-like institutions where they languish for months, even years. Tell us what you're seeing on the ground, bird's eye, Um, you know, kids really, really struggling. I think it's a matter of, and it's unfortunate, it's a matter of zip code. Um, Within our community, as an example, we are finding other options for young people so that they're not sleeping in the caseworker's office overnight or or, or spending time in in institutions, Um, even though the number of of young people has has risen, certainly. Um, It's a matter of zip code, which is part of, I think, of what Sherry was saying about the lack of standardization of services and funding of services for young people across the country. In some communities, yes, indeed, that is occurring. In others, they've been able to come up with innovative um, um, plans for how to care for children even with a foster care shortage. But the foster care shortage is certainly impacting everyone. So let me drill down here. You talked about this depends on the zip code you're in. Is there a socioeconomic divide here? Is there a racial divide here as far as the kids that you're seeing coming into the system? Well, you know, this is this is an epidemic that's a little different because it doesn't absolutely respect any socioeconomic race, gender, other <laughs> divisions. It it has an impact on everyone. Um, I think it's a matter of the resources that are available to the local child welfare agency. Um, I, I have seen in Florida where um, there are youngsters who are staying in the basement of one of the um, offices as opposed to being able to be placed immediately mm-hmm. in foster care. In our community, we immediately find a bed for them within one of the foster care agencies, but it's really a matter of what resources are available, mm-hmm. and there's disparity in resources or the way in which the local child welfare agencies are being able to match funding and, and other um, people resources, so to speak, human resources. Yeah, I hear you. Um, children. Let me get Jay in here calling from Wilmington, North Carolina. Hi, Jay, you're on the air. Welcome to the program. Hi, Jane. Hi, go ahead. So um, I am a district court judge that hears um, foster care cases hmm. uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina. I hear all of the cases uh, that involve our Department of Social Services 
Uh, we've seen a dramatic spike in, in removals. We're up 93% over about the last four years, and, and opioids are driving that. Um, but, wow. but one of the big differences between some of the earlier crises we've had with substance abuse and children coming into care, parents are dying now. Um, I've had five or six parents die in the last 60 days. Hmm. Um, and that's, you know, so, so the, the, the trauma is exponential in this crisis because... You know, it, it's hard enough when we're 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 working with with opioid addicts to to try to help them through recovery in the in the face of the recidivism numbers we know about. But but when we add add to the the mix that 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 some of the parents are actually dying overdosing, um, you know, those those kids' lives are never going to be the same ever. So this really is a new class of a foster child judge uh, s- specific to the opioid uh, crisis. Really is, and and the other piece of of that child is that that more and more are uh, are neonatal abstinence syndrome babies the babies are born addicted who have to go through withdrawal after birth um, our numbers are up in in New Hanover County uh, I think 2016 we had about um, 55 we call them NAS births NAS births mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we're for 2017 it's between 140 and 150 so are you scrambling? Are you seeing a scramble in the system? I mean, how are you handling the influx? You're, you're a judge there. You see these foster court cases coming in. What do you do? How do you so, handle it? So foster, foster care system is stretched. Um, thank God we have lots of relatives who are willing to, to step up and help. Um, but the system's stretched. Um, and, and, and resources are stretched. You know, we, we, we've got a, a pilot program here that's trying to respond to work with, with the brand new parents of these babies, but we can only work with a few because of the intensive level of services. We have lots of success, but the cost is front end cost is fairly significant. And um, you know, at some point, I think government's going to have to step up and yeah. spend some more money to to help. The needs are just so so intense, Jane. Jay, thank you very much for your uh, unique insight, uh, Chief District Court Judge there in Wilmington, North Carolina. Let me bring in Brittany Barrows now. She's 19, studying social work at Eastern Michigan University. She spent four years in Michigan's foster care system and later under her grandmother's guardianship because of her mother's addiction to opiates and other drugs. Today, she volunteers as a young leader with Foster Club, which is a national network helping young people in foster care. And she joins me from Ypsilanti, Michigan. Brittany, I'm so glad you could be with us. Thank you for taking the time. Hi, yes. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be on NPR. Well, thank you. Tell us why you entered the foster care system. Your mom was addicted. How old were you? Yes. um, My first time, I was actually in foster care twice because of my mother's addiction. Um, My first time, I was in sixth grade. I was about 11 years old, and CPS was made aware. Um, Because my mother chose to put her addiction over, or it's not really a choice, but when she was more addicted to drugs than being able to take care of my siblings and I, we didn't have the best suitable living environments. So CPS was made aware of these living environments, and um, we were taken away because uh, she took a drug test, and she failed um, dirty for cocaine, marijuana, and um, Vicodin. Um, Originally, uh, she was prescribed um, medication because she was diagnosed with permanent nerve damage, but that eventually turned into addiction. Um, My second time in foster care, um, because we were reunited with my mom, my second time in foster care, my brother crashed the car into the house and we became homeless. And my mother relapsed because of the stress and how much um, the poverty that we experienced and we endured. Her mental health started to decline, and she relapsed on um, her medication and other drugs as well. Mm. Can you explain to people who've never been through it how it feels to watch a parent uh, become addicted to opioids and, and to really watch a family fall apart because of it? Yes, it is the most painful and traumatic thing I've ever been in my life. And it's, it has like a domino effect as well. Um, so, for example, once me and my siblings were taken away, I was separated from my siblings because of my mom's drug addiction. I've been separated from my siblings for five years now. And every night I dream of them that we would be reunited again. And my mom would always make these false promises that she would get clean, that she would that she would do good on her drug test, that she would go to rehab, and these empty promises really 
had me and my siblings in a in a distrust for adults in general. Um, and not only that, we were speaking earlier on on the phone about being slept in, like shipped away in a prison like group home or sleeping in caseworkers office offices. My siblings and I were that kids. I've had to sleep in a caseworker's office because there was uh, a shortage in foster homes, mm -hmm. which was even more traumatizing, just waiting to even see if you're worthy enough of a home. As, as, at least that's how it felt like at 11. And then I was also shipped off to a group home. Um, and currently my brother's also lived in a group home. He's been in a group home for about five or six years now. Wow. So you're 19 now, uh, you're studying social work, you're a talented lady. I read that you play the clarinet, the saxophone, uh, the piano. Your long-term goal is to become a foster care worker and a foster parent, is that right? Yes. What, what, yes what, I want to give, yeah. go ahead, sorry. Well, what do, you, what, do you, what do you hope to instill in the kids that are in your home? Um, I want to give them the best love and condition that I, that I didn't get to receive as a kid. You know, I, I was thankful to have one foster family that treated me really nice. But unfortunately, a lot of these foster homes with inadequate training on how to be like a great foster parent, they, I felt like I was treated wrong um, in both group homes and foster care set in foster home settings. So taking my experience with feeling like I wasn't getting the proper care that I needed, I want to, you know, change that within the system as a foster parent to give these children um a better loving and suitable home environment. We are looking at the continuing uh, scourge of the opioid addiction in this country and how it's impacting the foster care system. I'm Jane Clayson. This is On Point. Sherry Lackman, you're here. You're nodding your head. You have been through this. I mean, you started a very uh, important organization, Foster America, to try to uh, cultivate new foster parents in this country, but you were a foster child yourself. What do you hear in Brittany's story? And given everything you've been through, um, what, do you, what do you see in this experience? First of all, I hear tremendous courage in Brittany's story. Having been a foster child myself, I know how painful and, and sometimes embarrassing it is to talk about one's past experiences in foster care. And Brittany's doing it not because it's easy, but because she has so much empathy for other kids going through what she went through that she's going to sacrifice her own, her own happiness to be able to help these other kids. So I just wanted to commend Brittany for being willing to devote her life to this work, even though being in the field day to day for a kid who has been in foster care is inherently re-traumatizing. Why do you think you did so well, Sherry Lockman, when so many kids struggle? You're very accomplished. Columbia Law, Harvard Kennedy School, Penn, University of Cambridge. I mean, the list goes on. Why do you think you kind of came and came out of it? Mm. Like any foster kid, in many ways, my childhood was hell. But I was very lucky to have friends, a supportive father, and teachers in my life who helped me get through that hell. Give you an example, my fourth grade teacher, my fourth grade English teacher, Ms. Owen, saw me crying in class one day. I was really upset about something that was going on in my circumstances at the time. And she pulled me out and she told me that I could someday use my experiences in foster care to make a difference for other kids. And her words literally saved my life. They helped me go from feeling like a victim of my circumstances to feeling empowered to use those circumstances rather than have them use me to make a difference for other kids going through similar types of situations. And her words have motivated my work to this day. They are why I worked hard in school because I knew I needed to earn a certain level of education to have the credibility that I needed to fight for other kids in the system. They are why I spent the past over a decade fighting to improve not only child welfare, but other systems for vulnerable kids. And they are why I started Foster America. And by the way, Ms. Owen, I've tried to track you down. If you're listening, please connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. It's a very inspiring story, actually. Helen Jones, Kelly, jump back in here in Ohio. Uh, you're seeing this scourge uh, really flood the system in, in foster care there. You, you hear Sherry's story, you hear Brittany's story. What would you tell kids in foster care who are really struggling in the midst of this crisis? 
I want them to know that there there is a rainbow on the other side, and 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 they are very courageous, both of them, for sharing their story. Um, in their story, they're able to provide hope for others. I think the important piece is, and that I think they both bring that message really well, is that there has to be a level of system collaboration in order to be able to do this well. Um, unfortunately, many of our, self, our child welfare systems operate in silos, and without partnering with our juvenile justice systems, with the schools, and with other systems, law enforcement and others, to really hone in on trauma and the aftermath of that trauma and how we all serve our young people in the community is a failure. We will talk about that collaboration after the break. Uh, we are talking about the opioid crisis and its impact on the foster care system in this country and how we make that system better. You can join us. Have you ever wanted to be a foster parent but were scared out of it? What would make you consider it? I've got a board of calls here. Stick with me. We'll get to you after the break. Uh, I'm Jane Clayson. This is On Point. We'll be right back. It's not a secret, parenting is hard. But maybe we shouldn't put so much pressure on ourselves. To get to good outcomes, sometimes you do better by not worrying about outcomes at all. I'm Shankar Vedantam, host of Hidden Brain. Join us as we explore two very different models of what it means to raise a human. This is On Point. I'm Jane Clayson. We're talking about the opioid epidemic and the foster care crisis this hour, and you can join the conversation. Do you have a story to share? What do you hear in this conversation? Follow us on Twitter and find us on Facebook at On Point Radio. Great uh, panel of guests this hour. Helen Jones Kelly, Executive Director of Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services for Montgomery County, Ohio. Sherry Lackman, Founder and Executive Director of Foster America. And Brittany Barros, formerly a foster child and now a volunteer, a mentor of sorts to other foster kids with an organization called Foster Club. CBS News reporter Dean Reynolds visited Blue Creek, Ohio in August, an area that has been ravaged by opioid abuse. Here, he talks with Suzanne Valley, who had taken in her brother's four kids, as well as an infant, because their parents are opioid addicts. Reynolds then speaks with Jack, a 14-year-old forced into the foster care system because of an addicted parent. Suzanne Valley agrees that this is not a gathering storm. The storm is upon us. I do do foster care, but it's almost like it's not enough because there's so many kids that need somebody. Kids like Jack. We won't show his face because he's only 14. He's been in and out of foster care four different times. I called my dad one day and I was like, Dad, why can't you just try and get me? And he was like, I just can't stop. Like, the drugs overtook him. And I was like, you're one messed up dad to pick drugs over your own kid. And I just hung up. The storm is upon us. Let's go to Susan in Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, Susan. You're on the air. Hi, Jane. Hi, Hi. Sherry. Um, Hello. Hi. Thank you for calling. Go ahead. Well, um, I agree with Sherry. I'm former foster youth. I left my... um, opioid addicted mother when I was 15 and got myself into foster care. Fortunately, there were um, people around me who could help. Um, I just want to make the point, however, that um, it, it's an epidemic, not just of drug addiction, but also of pain. I know why my mother became a drug addict. And when you lose your job, when you have repeated traumas in your own life, when you are abused physically, uh, Anything like that is going to cause a trauma that you need to help get over. And I can understand. I know why my mother became a drug addict. So I guess I'm saying that all of these things are connected. Um, Drug addiction, pain, economic development, it's all connected. And what I think we need to do to fix the problem, and and that's why I'm so grateful that people like Sherry and other of us are out there, and Brittany as well, is they need to start asking alumni. um, We call ourselves Alumni University of Life, Mm -hmm. right? Um, We need to start asking alumni their opinion and start talking to them about how they would recommend that they fix the problem. So right now it's, you know, often um, social workers who are so overworked just trying to get the day done. And I think we really need a conversation that's integral. Um, More alumni need to get hired into the system um, to help solve that problem. And I also think donors, um, you know, when they're looking at things to support, this is really an excellent cause, right? 
if we were looking to, to spur on innovation, um, this is really how we're going to do it, by talking with alumni and putting resources um, and brains toward this problem. Excellent point, so. Susan. I'm so glad you called from Baltimore. Uh, Sherry, what about the foster care alumni out there? What do you think they'd say about a, mm. a, so a solution I, here? I 100% agree with Susan. I think one of the po- points you brought up is incredibly important, which is that the child welfare crisis is both a root cause as well as a devastating consequence of other societal problems. So society needs to wake up and care about this issue, even if not as an end unto itself, if they care about other issues like poverty, crime, and drug addiction. Right. So I'm, I'm reading here 70% of youth in the juvenile justice system has spent time in, in the child welfare system. As many as 70%, depending on the region that you're looking at. A third of homeless young adults were previously in foster care. That's right. Black kids are twice as likely as white kids to wind up in foster care. That's absolutely right. And they're twice as likely to wind up in foster care. And then, of course, twice as likely to experience its devastating consequences. The foster care system really at the root of many problems. It is absolutely the root of many problems. And it's penny wise and pound foolish to wait until these problems become much larger rather than addressing it upstream by working on the child welfare crisis. So Helen Jones Kelly talked about collaboration. What mm-hmm. would you like to see in, in, in terms of that? Uh, ab- absolutely. So I, I started an organization called Foster America based on the premise that we can't solve the child welfare crisis with the current set of solutions that we've tried again and again and again, that it will take a much broader tent of people to do it. When I started Foster America, I didn't assume I had all the answers. I understood just how devastating the outcomes were for kids in the system. So what I did is I went and I interviewed over 100 experts in child welfare across the country to get a sense from them of what is at the root of the child welfare crisis and our inability to solve it. What are the underlying problems? What did you find? And there are a number of reasons for this, but one of the major reasons that they brought up again and again in these interviews that I felt like I could wrap my arms around and do something about is that there's a major leadership and skills gap in the sector. And what they meant by that was actually two things. First, they meant that while there are some wonderful reform-minded leaders in the sector, they are few and far between. And of course, many of the wonderful leaders in the sector are alumni who truly get what kids in the system are going through. The second thing they meant is that the sector is incredibly insular. And in any high-functioning sector, you actually need a diversity of skill sets to solve complex challenges. And child welfare is no different. The problems in child welfare are interdisciplinary in nature, yet we've been attacking them with just one tool in the toolbox, which is social work. So you're looking at basic issues like marketing and recruitment strategies, right? Absolutely. So as part of the solution to this, what Foster America is doing is it created a fellowship program that's very much inspired by fellowships that we've seen in other sectors like Broad and Global Health Corps that have built effective movements for change in other sectors. But we're doing this in child welfare, and we're doing it geared to the needs of the child welfare system. So specifically, we go out and we recruit mid-career professionals from the business, tech, public health, and education sectors. People with skill sets that are sorely needed but often lacking in child welfare. And are they willing? They are, actually. Um, While there are many challenges that we face as a startup nonprofit, um, including funding, as Susan was mentioning, Mm -hmm. because there's a funding desert in the child welfare field, surprisingly, the least challenging thing for us thus far has been recruiting top talent. It's not a majority of people, for example, in the business sector who want to go and devote their lives to child welfare, but there's a significant minority of people who want to use their skill sets and devote it to some kind of social good. And our argument to them is, if you want to help literally the most vulnerable kids in the country, come join us. And essentially what we do is, after we recruit these folks from other sectors, we place them in high impact fellowship roles, mainly in government, child welfare agencies across the country, but also in some nonprofits as well. And then we have a short-term and a long-term goal for them. So in the short term, our fellows are working on major reform projects that require their specialized skills, interdisciplinary challenges. So take, for example, the problem of the shortage of foster families across the country. That's a social work problem, but it's also a marketing problem. It's also a customer service problem. So we recruit people with marketing and customer service skills from other sectors to come in and partner with social workers on um, improving 
that part of the system. And our long-term goal beyond the projects that our fellows work on is to, over time, graduate enough of a critical mass of alumni from our program to create a movement for change. Hmm. You're fighting the good fight. Uh, let's go to Karen in Westwood, Massachusetts. Hi, Karen. You're on the air. Welcome. Hi, Jane. Hi. I have. Um, I started the process to adopt a child through foster care um, almost three years ago, and since June of 2016, I have been waiting to be matched with a child. And I can tell you that the social workers that I have met have been excellent, but the process they use to match us is could really use with some some of those tech people that um, mm-hmm. your other your guest was just talking about because mm-hmm. they are like sending an email to an agency saying I have this child do you have anyone who matches or they're holding these events where you kind of go in and you meet with some social workers and then there's like really difficult time to follow up it's like the process is so antiquated mm-hmm. that I mean I've been shocked that it's been a year and a half and I still haven't been You're still waiting. Forever. You're still trying. You're willing, Karen. Thank you. Helen Jones Kelly, I mean dealing with foster agencies is often not a pleasant experience as you hear Karen saying. And, I, and we hear that a lot and there's a lot of bureaucracy um, in in terms of the matching process and even the wait time. Um, well, I I agree with a, a previous comment about needing more dollar resources in the system, we need better thinking in the system. Uh, We need to reframe the way in which we go about this business. And when we think about leadership and some of the things that need to occur within our child welfare agencies, we need people who take on this role and serve these young people the same way they would serve their own children in their own homes. Mm. And if we can begin to think about our foster youth in that way, then we can begin to make a difference because we would indeed connect all of the systems in order to make something happen for our own children. Well, we've been talking about raising the awareness uh, for the need for foster families in the midst of this opioid crisis. A news report this morning caught our eye on KWCH-TV in Wichita, Kansas. It's about a gentleman named Glenn Coster, a former foster child who will soon start walking across the country to raise awareness about the need for foster care and adoption. Uh, Let me bring in Glenn here now. He's in um, Hutchison, Kansas. Glenn, great to have you with us. Hi, Jane. You got your boots ready? Better be good boots getting you across the country. (laughs) I I will go through about eight pairs of shoes in my 4,400-mile walk. Oh, my goodness. So tell us why you want to do this. I'm doing it because I'm a product of the system. I was abandoned at six, adopted, 13 months later pulled out of that home for abuse and neglect, and readopted. And in between those two adoptions, I saw the other side of the system as a foster care child where I had a foster father pass away just after Thanksgiving, but they couldn't find a place to put me. So I had to stay there through the funeral and through a very dark Christmas. They moved me the day after Christmas in 1964. It Mm -hmm. hasn't gotten any better. So what do you want? Well, what do you want people to know today about what kids are struggling with? uh, Kids who need a home. The biggest thing kids are struggling with that need a home is they simply want to be loved. Mm -hmm. And the thing I will tell foster potential foster parents and potential adoptive parents is you've got to love them unconditionally because they will break your heart. You have to forgive them unconditionally because, believe it or not, they're going to do the same things over and over and over. And some of those things are the things from their birth families or their, their other families. For instance, I'm a... I'm a recovering alcoholic. Um, I've been sober since March of 1989 and a former spousal abuser who has been violence-free since May of 1989. Those were things I learned in my birth home. Mm -hmm. The other thing I tell them is they have to lead by example uh, because foster children are going to look up to those foster parents. It's somebody who is finally a role model for them that sets a standard. So you've got to lead in ways you never thought. Mm -hmm. Well, good luck to you. We wanted to uh, give you a little shout out there today because what you're doing is terrific. And people can follow your journey on Facebook, KS Charity Steps. Glenn Coster in uh, Hutchison, Kansas. When do you start your walk? I start my walk February 1. We actually leave Kansas today on our way to Florida. And I will start in Miami Beach February 1 and hope to finish in LaPouche, Washington on October 5. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you very much for spending time with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Cynthia in Springfield, Illinois. Cynthia, welcome to the program. Hi. Thank you for having me. Sure. My question is um, we recently gained custody of my grandson, who is 12, uh, due to the 
you know, drug addiction of his mother. And, you know, we're doing everything we can as far as getting him, you know, his immunizations up and the, and dental care. He was very neglected for a long time, which came as a surprise to us because it was very well hidden. And um, Brittany, I, I think it was Brittany, um, talked about things that parents need that she needed and she didn't get. Mm-hmm. Cooper doesn't talk a whole lot. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. How, I don't know how he's feeling. What specifically as a guardian or as a foster parent, do we do we need to do? What are you looking, what are these kids looking for? Cynthia, thank yeah. you. Brittany, jump in here. Uh, you were a foster child. Your siblings are still in the foster care system. Cynthia wants to know, what do you need? What could you have used? What should she be doing? Yes. Um, so as a foster parent, um, being very aware and uh, Conscious, um, conscientious about family connections and sibling connections. Um, my brothers and sisters, foster parents, they did everything in their power to make sure I couldn't see my siblings purposely. And I honestly didn't know why, and I was confused and scared and, and hurt. And as a foster parent, I think it's really important that you give, um, you know, that uh, ability to be able to connect um, you know, your grandson with, like, his other siblings or his aunts or uncles or anyone that he has that supportive Mm -hmm. um, network within his family. Um, Another thing that you can do as a foster parent is definitely understand or um, try to conceptually understand why, if he acts out, what is it that is making him act out? Because a lot of times, you know, children that come with a lot of trauma often have a lot of emotional baggage. Um, for example, I've been diagnosed with PTSD, and because of that, those triggers can, anything can trigger um, a flashback from the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not like a lot of times children are trying to act out or misbehave or, um, you know, if they're acting a certain way, like understanding why and what could have happened for them. And well, Sympathy and, 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 and empathy. Right. Uh, yeah, it can go a long way. We just about have a minute left here. Sherry Lockman, I want to give you the last word. Give us the pitch in the midst of this opioid crisis, which brought us to this topic in the first place. So many kids flooding the system, not enough homes for them. Give us the pitch. Someone's on the fence. Why should they become mm-hmm. a foster parent? We're not going to solve our child welfare crisis until many people, many more people join hands and make this crisis their own to solve. We need many more families to open their homes and hearts. And if you're thinking about this, please go to the website Fostermore to get more information. Even if you're not able to open your home at this point in time, there are other incredibly impactful things that you can do. For example, please go to the CASA website. Um, We need more philanthropists to get involved, and we need more politicians to take on this issue and provide the system with the funding and resources that it needs. Well, this has been a heartbreaking uh, but enlightening hour as well. Uh, Many thanks to this terrific panel. Brittany Barros, former foster child, um, youth leader with Foster Club. Now, Brittany, thank you, and good luck to you, my friend. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Helen Jones-Kelly, Executive Director uh, at Mental Health Services for Montgomery County, Ohio. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. And Sherry Lackman, Founder and Executive Director of Foster America. What great work you're doing, and we appreciate you coming here today in the midst of a huge storm. Thank you. Thank you. Listeners, you can continue uh, with our On Point podcast. Twitter, Facebook, we're there. I'm Jane Clayson. This is On Point. Thank you.